yeah speaking of, i mean i thought that's what i was thinking about as you're explaining their vengeance you know that it just feels like this is what's happening I just... for me i keep coming back to this attitudinal healing thing i'm not a victim of the world that i see you know if we could teach this kind of um, peaceful way of being you know everything is about projection it's killing and killing each other and turning turning the other into the enemy you know it's all this uh, maya you know sickness of ego absolutely uh, you know there just needs to be some kind of bridge to you know between spirituality and day-to-day that's and that's why i've been so excited about attitudinal healing and kind of reading these principles to myself every morning um i i just i just see like also uh where my attention goes my energy flows and so if i'm looking for uh, persecution and victimhood out in the world I, i'll find it and you know in space I, you know, i've lived i've lived that way and it makes me physically sick mentally emotionally sick when i'm constantly focusing on the threat and feeling the, the impact of the threat in my body you know so i really have to be selective and recovering from burnout and you know major chronic depression you know debilitating i got to be really careful about uh, where i go with my attention i want to bring my attention you know, mainly to to anything that i can do so i can be so i can restore my ability to be a better impact in the world because in you know where i got myself like i got myself so low i couldn't i couldn't make any kind of positive change i felt like and that was a lot because I was putting my attention into being an activist without the right kind of support in place, I guess. I think that a lot of act people who are activism minded and peace minded uh, went into tailspin, you know, during the Trump years, especially. Yeah, that's some good self awareness. And it's, Part of where I was thinking about this talk today, and I'm always trying to balance this out, is, is to imagine that we are making impact. And so whatever it is that we individually are doing has an impact collectively. And if we are just filling it with more of that resentment and frustration and anger and unresolved emotion, like that, that ripples, that's, that's what we're the effect we're having um well for me it's you know we're in this part of the world where one of the common phrases is change the world change the world you know it's it's the tech industry runs on changing the world and um i've been allergic to that phrase for that reason but i also believe what has just been expressed there that you know you can embody that change in your own way and create those ripples um, and especially when you find people that you can come together with and just share an idea or an emotion or a feeling that does change the world and it's a very small, but potentially powerful way. And, um, so I appreciate that because I don't like thinking about change the world from the boil the ocean perspective. It's too much, mm. too much for my head. Yeah, it does feel like a, a rephrasing of this concept of, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I just love hearing that, you know, when countless people are going inward to address their past and their inner turmoil, it just seems like that's not, you know, the general theme. It's like, it's just people are from their past wounds and hurts they're propelling forward at a scary pace that's just causing more and more mess and mm -hmm. uh, so i love this idea that it's harnessing the energy of those who are willing to look at what's happened and what are the harms how can i not repeat them um and and actually imagine that some of the things that we do that create joy 
and lightness, that that also is a beautiful offering, you know, to not forget that that's valuable. Um, we need to do that. And I think sometimes as an activist, it can sound like, well, you're not supposed to do that, or you've got to like stay so like ready at all times, you know? And I think that that, like you were talking earlier, Lars, can can lead to a type of burnout um, if, if we're not remembering like, yeah, we got to also send out ripples of, you know, lightness and joyfulness. I mean, in the corporate world too, you know, I was talking about that was a new client just a moment ago. He's, he's in that world. And he said, um, wow, this feels so good on my body. I feel it's like something in my body is also talking to my brain. That's so used mm -hmm. to being in the corporate setting, like, relax like feel the connections of this you know this is important instead of these separate ways of being like you know there's something so seductive and like uh, magnetizing about the negativity in the world um, um, i mean that's why i'm hooked on i'm better but but i'm still hooked on reading the news in the morning it's where my mind wants to go and i'm i keep on reframing and being like i want to start the day with sensory awareness i want to start the day i am starting the day with deep breathing i am starting the day with slowing down and pausing and yet there's still this there's some magnetic pull for that sympathetic fight flight experience uh that i, I it's really pretty diabolical um how how hooking and negative you know negative mind is i guess it's because it's our more ancient primitive brain but you got to imagine the hannibal directive and the you know the stuff that you're describing in israel um people are just fully in that um i'm a victim of you you did that you know fully in in a victim or aggressor binary um uh, I and mean, it's just, the, it's really hard to recognize when you're in a trance, um, like being on a psychedelic trip, almost, you don't, it just seems absolutely like this is what's real. I mean, I think I, I through my, my incredible descent into the inferno over years of depression and pain and self abuse, you know, I think I understand that it's because our more ancient brain you know was geared was to was was um wired to look for danger in, in everything um and that my uh my my potential my capacity is also to get hooked on things that give a little reward so looking at my facebook feed and you know going down the path of using weed which makes one more paranoid and, and less in touch with reality together created the conditions where that primitive limbic brain just was my everything for a long long time so like and um, but i see now what where you know the conditions that came together to create you know a massive uh, implosion of my of my mind body there even with all the tools i had from living at Esalen for eight years i still you know uh, knew it going in i'm like this you know I, I really don't feel good looking at my social media all day and yet this is connection you know feels like feels kind of like connection but it's actually something something a little bit more base than that it's not like real connection and that's what i struggle with too is this idea that and I, I have used that word too, where it feels like so many people get into a trance that's not even their, their design. You know, it's like either some person, a uh, parent, an elder, a political figure, someone with power who convinces you of a story. And then that seems like there's no other way but that story. And then you defend it, which is just so interesting. Somehow that person who started the story can effectively convince others to help uphold that story. Um, and I think we're seeing that in our own country. 
as well as it's happened in so many countries uh, and so many periods of history that it just, you know, it's mostly I, I often say, I feel like it's very sad, but lately I'm like saying it's very interesting <laughs> that there's just this ability for us to do things like that to one another. It's just, it's just interesting to me that why? And I think it is like you're saying, it just goes back to these, our original systems of being our, our ancient um, model of our nervous system that hasn't really evolved much. And so if we're staying in, you know, we had, we have a sympathetic nervous system for an excellent reason, but if it's constantly being triggered and then constantly being reinforced with fear tactics and stories that make you think at any moment you're not safe. Yeah, your mind isn't able to manage that except to then create some other story that creates some relief. That story, which is, you know, we have to do this or else. Okay, we see that's... each other as fragments. We don't see each other as multidimensional, complex, multifaceted beings. You know, we see each other as fragments. And I think that's because that threat you know part of the of the uh ancient nervous system is always looking for the threat so we reduce one another like internal family systems talks about the myth of the mono mind we reduce one another very quickly you know before we even know it that's there's a website that describes like how most people any race will look at a photo of a black person and, and immediately consider that more of a threat than another person we're not in a system that creates the conditions and capacity to, to realize context and multidimensional you know, mm. uniqueness of each person. So that it, it, it is interesting. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really, I really want to be part of the, of the wave of change that changes these systems because these systems are so primitive in many ways. We're so advanced and yet we're just so primitive without without an ability to be authentic and self-reflecting and owning you know we're doomed to just to keep repeating the cycle well that i i'm one of the counter movements that i'm finding more and more value and appreciation around is the rest and restorative and you know, disengaging uh, from our culture of, you know, over productivity, um, the over ambitious, you know, that that's always the winner, but instead let it be the one who can actually rest and take it easy. That to me is one of the antidotes here because it'll allow the nervous system to soften into that parasympathetic nervous system state, which is where the healing happens, which is where some balancing out happens. But if we're always, I mean, I just think about, you know, people like our president and people who have been presidents and leaders and like the amount of stress, like when do they get to totally disengage from that? And maybe you don't get to. But man, how do you ever have a, a different picture of what could be? Unless you wake up, you become unaware that there is a different state, right? So those people who are in that constant state of alarm, alertness, achievement, whatever it is, they don't, they don't see how elevated that state is for them and that there is an alternative. Yes. It becomes the norm. Yeah. And, you know, and that's why people right now who are in this state of total alarm or total reactivity are unable to see the other side because they're just, they're just completely surrounded by it. Um, and I see that too. I've been there myself, um, you know, different circum circumstances for sure. Um, but it's amazing to have the opportunity to be on the other side of it and to see it and say, oh, I, I recognize that as something that's not the norm or doesn't have to be the norm. That's quite, yeah, I'm hopeful maybe that somehow we might, as a society, find those ways to awaken. 
Yeah. What, what do you think some, I mean, the, the rest and restore uh, is, is one, but what, what are your sure. thoughts about Well, for me, you know, um, I just had to take myself out of my circumstance and be, and be physically somewhere else and be surrounded by people who were not my normal family and, and friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. And um, it was almost immediate how much effect that had for me. Um, and, and uh, you know, I know that that's not feasible to do for everybody all the time, but maybe if there were some ways of just changing something about the circumstance of the environment of the conversation such that the light comes in just a little bit. Search for Common Ground was this wonderful organization. They still are, and they, they create media to unite, like, the, the Israelis and the Palestinians through, like, soap operas on the radio and stuff, and then people start to take that extra little, you know, little tentative step out into connecting with each other more, trusting each other a little bit more. And we see like the models coming through of people getting along, mm -hmm. major rift. That reminds me of a very quick story, if you don't mind. Um, so I was married to a woman who was Hungarian. She was born in Hungary during communist Hungary and uh, raised in a small town in Hungary. And, you know, communism didn't really end until she was 20, 21 years old. Um, and uh, and her father was um, just really affected by, you know, this loss of control, this loss of uh, autonomy that he had in his whole life. And um, it also, also kind of emotionally stunted as, you know, just really never grew up. And so he was very quick tempered, very sort of hot headed, and uh, we went to the uh, aptly named Museum of Terror in Budapest, which is really about communism and, you know, the Holocaust and all the things that happened and went through Hungary in big waves. And it's a documentation of history. And it does it in a very, very beautiful sort of distance way such that you can experience it without it being, isn't this horrible, but you're just, you're experiencing it. But... Um, <clears throat> You know, we're walking up the stairs and on the stairs are these busts of the different sort of party leaders during the eras. And he's slapping each bust on the face as he goes by. And then um, <laughs> we're in one room and, and there are these classrooms that had paper, like they were papered with articles that were basically, you know, defamatory articles about somebody who might become too important and so they wanted to take them down. And so he's leaning over something and trying to read it and he's actually touching the exhibit. And this guy says, please don't touch the exhibit. And he just lost it. Because this, he's in this environment of control and somebody's telling him what to do in this environment of control. And he lost it. And, you know, they were going to throw him out. And I was like, oh, shit, we're all going to get thrown out of here. And then this old guy came along and this old guy's like, I totally understand where you're coming from. I had, let me tell you about this one time. And he just starts telling him stories. And the two of them just like told stories to each other the entire time. And it turns out this old guy was an employee of the Museum of Terror who was there for that exact reason. Oh my bring goodness. Them out of their spiral and bring them into a, hey, I got a great story for you. He listened to this. And oh, wow. immediately the two of them connected, like you were just saying, Lars, over a shared history, took his blood pressure way down. He enjoyed the rest of the experience. And it was just miraculous to see. It really was miraculous. Right. And they planned because yeah. they knew it was going to happen. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a model for what we need in our, <laughs> our world of the leaders who, I mean, it's, that to me is just so powerful where relatability, conversation, settling, somebody mm -hmm. who got completely aroused in their emotions can actually create a significant change in an outcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, who knows? I don't know your father that well, but maybe it could have, you know, led somebody else. It could have led into an argument and then throwing something or, you know, who knows what. And that does happen. Um, mm -hmm. Or this really intelligent person who knew that this was possible brought in this man who knows how to do this to then create a, 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 a beautiful shift mm -hmm. that everybody needed, you know, mm -hmm. healing. Yeah. I think we need more of that kind of um, uh, fulcrum into the MAGA movement because, you know, it's very easy to be for or anti-maga but but for me if i see what the roots like 
down at the core of it, people feel victimized by the system, by the drug system, by losing their jobs and you know the poverty. So they want revenge on the politicians. But I think there's a big common ground there with both sides. But but you know because it's so polarized and so um, kind of curated to 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 butt heads as it is, you know, there, there's got to be some more space for um, for for finding common ground, like Jerry Springer used to do, you know, uh, bring people together who <laughs> end up you know, in a fist fight, but uh, they're all Americans. I, mean, I never gave him that much credit. That's interesting. You're right. <laughs> yeah, and he always said, "Be good to yourselves and each other." Good. End of his. Is... Oh. Jerry Springer's from my hometown, Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Jerry, <laughs> but uh, Jerry. no, I actually yeah. did, did. We used to watch that every now and again because it was. I don't know how much it was staged, but it did feel like it gave a representation of there is a way to maybe come together when you feel like something really got splintered and broken it's catharsis mm. yeah and 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 like your story like working with trauma um you know in a certain kind of way mm -hmm. yeah um, and identifying identifying at that level and you know mark you were saying earlier people are bottling it up they're not being they're not addressing it going inward and it, this was away inward right it was yeah i experienced that too i'd like to tell you about my experience tell me about yours and he's 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 visiting those moments in a very different way of course but it was healing for him and an important role of our elders yeah and our our modern elders um of all yeah. sorts but our actual elders who have um you know certain kinds of insight that an experience to talk about that have seen things repeat uh, in our in our world history. Um, well, I we're we're nearing our our last handful of minutes, and I feel like in a way, as always, we're just getting started. But that's why we do this every week, so we can jump back in on some of these. Um, but I want to also just pro propose one other tool, which I think we all know about too, which is some kind of an insight um, practice like meditation. Um, where you actually can start to see yourself because you you sort of step out of the the chaos room for a moment of the mind and you 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 let yourself be with whatever's there, what rises, what comes up, what keeps coming up. I like this analogy that's been given, I forget who to credit, but it's this idea of the mind being like a speeding car. And as long as you keep your foot on the pedal, you keep giving it gas, it's going to keep going and going and going. But even when you release your foot from the pedal, the car will keep still going for a while. And so you've got to hang in there while it keeps going. And then eventually it'll start to coast and it will eventually come to a stop. But if we keep engaging, engaging, it'll keep doing what it knows what to do um, to run wild. So what do we, what can we do that helps us disengage um, sort of per your story, Ken? Um, I was talking earlier with Lars about also to discharge. So sometimes like mm -hmm. how kids, mm -hmm. they'll get mm -hmm. a little tantrum, but then they move on. Mm -hmm. So maybe sometimes it can be an outward thing that's healthy. That's not going to crash and burn something, but um, you know, something that helps us recognize like this is okay to do. Like this is, this is a re resourceful thing versus some of the things that aren't so sustainable just it makes it brings up a yearning and a longing for this class this this woman brooke deputy used to teach called reiki and bioenergetics at esalen where we would, it was a movement and kind of expression class and she would be like okay now now take a spot in the room and say this is my spot don't you step on my spot get out of my spot you know and and just go with it like an improv class um and uh you know it, it there, there's some discharge like just feeling it in your body like really and we would get down on the floor and have tantrums and stuff mm -hmm. she and she used to also do tremor release exercises tre which is also another way to discharge I thought, god the world needs more of this stuff 
I want to leave with one thing because you just made me think of this, Lars, that trying to claim your spot and screaming and this is mine. And it just made me think of how that happens on a global scale. Mm -hmm. And there's just some need. That's a, some, a need to let it get satisfied for a moment. And is that part of what we're seeing? Um, and what if eventually you're like, okay, okay, it's your, you know, or whatever. It, I don't know. What does someone need in that moment? I want to ask you more about that. What eventually then lets you let that go?